While Ease, which I don't know why I kept pronouncing it as Ease in the last video, I'm an idiot, has maintained a cult following in the West ever since the first game managed to release on the Sega Master System, it feels to me like the Ease series has finally begun to gain more attention in the English-speaking world as of late. What many newcomers may not be aware of is exactly how old and influential Ease and its developer Nihon Falcom truly are. Founded in 1981 by Masayuki Kato, Nihon Falcom's first game was 1983's Panorama Toe for the NEC PC-88, a game which I don't have anything in particular to say about, I just wanted to show off this awesome cover that I would gladly paint on the side of my van. If I had one! It was after Panorama Toe that Falcom would help form the very bedrock of role-playing video games in Japan with 1984's Dragon Slayer and its 1985 follow-up, Xanadu. The two games, alongside Hydlide by TNE Soft, paved the way for iconic franchises like Legend of Zelda. But while Shigeru Miyamoto and Nintendo were being lavished with praise for Zelda, a new team at Falcom, led by Masaya Hashimoto and Tomoyoshi Miyazaki, the future founders of Quintet, were working to craft their own take on this burgeoning subgenre of role-playing games. Initially released in June 1987 for the NEC PC-88, followed by a Sharp X1 version five days later, Ancient Ease Vanished Omen, or Ease 1 for brevity's sake, was an immediate hit and by the end of the year had been ported to basically every major home computer line in Japan. Since then, Ease has... hang on, let me get the list out... has been ported to the Famicom, Sega Master System, DOS, Apple II, as well as both Brew and Java 2 compatible phones. Ew. Mid-2000 cell phone gaming. In addition, it has received three separate remakes that I'm aware of. One on the Sharp X68000, one on the PC Engine CD-ROM slash TurboGrafx CD in a compilation with its direct sequel, and the one I played for this video. This version was originally released on Windows as Ease 1 and 2 Complete in 2001, but has since seen versions made for the PS2, DS, PSP, Windows a second time, and once again, mobile phones. That second version for Windows would be the one that made it stateside courtesy of Xseed Games as Ease 1 and 2 Chronicles Plus. I should note as well that the only real difference between Chronicles and Complete is that Chronicles uses the PSP version's character art rather than the original Windows versions, though you can toggle between the two whenever you wish. Personally, I prefer the look Complete went with, so that's the version you'll be seeing throughout the video. There's nothing wrong with the designs in Chronicles, mind you, I just really like the turn of the millennium anime art style because that's what I grew up with. The Ease series centers on wandering swordsman Adol Kristen, saver of days and dropper of panties across the world. Hello, ladies. Adol's quest in Ease 1 is straightforward enough. Sailing to the island of Asteria, Adol is shipwrecked by the perpetual storm encircling Asteria known as the Storm Wall. After being saved by Slaff and nursed back to health at his father's clinic, Adol heads to the walled town of Minea to replace his lost equipment. Once there, he's tasked by the fortune teller Sarah to collect the Books of Ease in order to save the land from the evil creeping out from the ominous Darm Tower. Suffice it to say that Adol's journey will be a lot tougher than the quick library run it may sound like at first. What will really make Ease stand out to modern players, though, is its gameplay, specifically in regard to how combat functions. Employing what is known as the Bump System, you attack enemies by, well, bumping into them. Under the hood, it's actually a sort of auto-resolve mechanic. If you bump into an enemy head-on, the game will instantly calculate the damage dealt out and to whom based on Adel and the enemy's respective stats. Early on, this is all but guaranteed to get you killed. The trick is to attack from the side, behind, or most likely, off-center like so. Doing this will result in the calculation favoring Adel. So long as your damage is high enough to hurt them in the first place, you'll be ripping your way through monsters in no time. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking this is a song. You're probably also thinking that this sounds ridiculous and couldn't possibly result in a fun game. That's certainly what I thought when I first played Ease. Then you start digging into the game and you soon realize how primally satisfying the bump system actually is. I've seen it compared to the sensation of popping bubble wrap, and that's perhaps the most apt way to put it. After a lifetime of running into enemies being nothing more than an easy way to lose health, you can at last subject enemies to the same treatment. My initial reaction to the bump system, though, was not helped by me trying to immediately fight the enemies outside the starter town, 
instead of running to the next town and buying equipment with the 1,000 gold I started with. Turns out that punching an army of Mokujins to death isn't as easy as Tekken made me believe. But in my defense, this is a really weird design choice instead of simply putting a smith in the first town. Which would be because the starting fishing village of Barbado wasn't in the original PC-88 version, but instead was added in the TurboGrafx CD version that I mentioned before. Though there, Adel gets to Asteria without the ship crashing, and is dragged by Sarah to Minea before you're even handed control. The original version of Ease, meanwhile, simply starts you in Minea without any initial in-game push in the right direction. Ah, games that required you to read the manual cover to cover before you booted them up. How conflicted are my feelings for ye. Before I get back to the version this video is actually about, I'd like to note that the PC-88 original is shockingly playable. This is a game from 1987 running on NEC's version of DOS at a reasonable frame rate, in full color, and nearly capable of smooth scrolling. You're telling me the Japanese players had access to gaming PCs this good in the 80s? I mean, just look at the actual MS-DOS version from 1989. Back on topic, I have to emphasize again just how addictive the bump system makes combat and ease. You tell yourself that you're only going to play for another 15 minutes or so because it's almost 2 in the morning and you're going out for an early lunch with family so you really should start winding down for the night. Then suddenly it's 4 a.m., Adel is max level, and you're currently fighting the boss guarding the third book of ease. And you know, seeing as how I've already screwed up my chances of a good night's sleep, I might as well beat the game tonight. Also helping the vicious cycle of addiction for me that is combat and ease is the inclusion of regenerating health. No, this isn't something they added later on as a quality of life improvement or the like. Even the original from 1987 has Adel primarily recovering HP through a regenerating health system. So long as you aren't in a dungeon and standing still, Adel's HP will slowly tick back up, and they wanted to make sure that this was the main tactic for players to recover as you can only carry a single health potion at a time. Thankfully, the dungeons in Ease are small enough that not too much time is lost going back to the entrance for some healing, though the PC-88 version could have stood to have the HP recover the slightest bit faster. You'll also eventually find a ring that will heal you in dungeons, so even that little wrinkle of running back outside every time you get hurt too bad stops being a problem soon enough. Though bosses do not give a damn what you have equipped. No heals for you! In spite of my previous references to Zelda, I wouldn't go so far as to refer to Ease as a Zelda-like. Max health is increased solely through level-ups with no heart containers or the like to be seen. Equipment and accessories play a bigger part to combat than any sort of item which significantly shakes up the gameplay, such as a bomb or boomerang. And backtracking is limited to delivering key items to NPCs instead of searching for hidden upgrades after unlocking a new means to progress. Being more an expansion of the gameplay concepts in Falcom's own Xanadu, I feel it's better to classify Ease as its own thing, evolving concurrently with The Legend of Zelda rather than being directly influenced by it. Now if we could just get developers aside from Falcom to make Ease likes, I'd be in heaven! Another thing I'd like to see more of in games today are these screens that pop up when you're shopping or talking to important NPCs. Maybe I'm alone on this, but these can really help characters stand out to me. Obviously, this was originally done to compensate for hardware limitations on 80s computers and kept in the remakes to retain a similar flavor, but I believe that a similar style would still work fine in indie games today. Finally, we have the boss battles. While the series would go on to be a sterling example of how to do boss fights correctly, it wouldn't be the first game that got the ball rolling on that. If you're having trouble with a boss in ease, it's because you're not at a high enough level or you need better equipment. Not because the boss itself is an actual challenge. The only two bosses I found to be a legit challenge were this wannabe Castlevania boss with his swarm of bats form being difficult to dodge at times, and the final boss. Which, if you aren't going to have many difficult bosses, I guess the final boss really should pose the biggest challenge. While the compositions in this version were done by mainstays of Falcom's sound team JDK, Hayato Sonoda and Takahiro Unisuga, and the arrangement done by Yukihiro Jindo, the original soundtrack of Ease was done by Yuzo Koshiro and Mieko Ishikawa. If you want to hear my praise for Koshiro's work in general, check out my ActRaiser video. This game, coupled with Ease 2, was the big breakthrough for both composers. 
Koshiro would go on to found Ancient and begin freelancing his musical talents through it, while Ishikawa became Falcom's go-to composer of the 90s, founding Sound Team JDK after a mass staff exodus, and nowadays she's an executive at Falcom who has worked as the production coordinator on every Ease since 2003, and every single Trails game. So that's two industry legends involved on one soundtrack. Is it that good? You tell me. Chills, man. I got chills when I first heard this song. Imagine being one of the people who played this when it first released in 1987 and hearing this coming from an 8-bit home computer. Where so many of its contemporaries went for something to hype the player up, Ease opted to open with this gentle, ethereal track. There are some old games where you hit the start screen and instantly know you're in for a treat. The rest of the soundtrack is just as great, ranging from the catchy field tune to the slower paced downbeat number used for the mines, all the way to the borderline power metal anthem of the final boss fight. The redone versions used in Chronicles are fantastic too. In a move interestingly similar to what Koshiro himself would go on to do for Actraiser Renaissance, the new soundtrack adds in not just the expected strings and wind instruments, but heavy amounts of rock and guitar. Excellent! The power metal and hard rock elements poking their way through in the original version of Ease had become an established part of the house style for Sound Team JDK by this point, and it's fucking awesome. Honestly, this awesomeness shouldn't be all that surprising considering that Falcom games in general are almost universally renowned for their soundtracks. And because I neglected to mention her last time with Actraiser, I should note as well that Ayano Koshiro, Yuzo Koshiro's younger sister, was the character designer for both Ease 1 and 2. Seeing as how this was the first game Ayano Koshiro is credited on, and that many of these designs have been simply iterated on in remakes rather than redone from the ground up, I'd say she did a damn good job. Even if I wasn't sure what to credit her with in Actraiser, as she was one of five different credited graphic designers, I could have bothered to mention her at least during the lengthy amount of time I spent praising her brother's work. Especially considering that Ayano Koshiro was the art director on Actraiser 2, and that's the one part of the game I truly like. Not to mention that she was one of the main planners on the legendary Streets of Rage 2. So yeah, definitely a woman who needs to be mentioned more when talking about notable designers of the 16-bit era. Okay, now we can talk story. Though stupid simple compared to what would come later, Ease 1 was among the first RPGs to provide a focus on story at all. It sounds ridiculous by today's standards, where the RPG is one of the premier genres for deep, involving stories, but many early RPGs are focused on combat and dungeon crawling, with only the barest elements of a narrative present to offer a motivation to the player. Now, I'm not claiming Ease was literally the first RPG to have an actual story that plays out across gameplay. Dragon Quest had come out the year prior, and the Ultima series was four entries deep by this point. But I believe it is worth noting how novel this still was in 1987. The story of Ease is centered around Adol's quest to find the Books of Ease, Six ancient tomes chronicling the final days of the Land of Ease. Each volume is named for the priest who wrote it and passed down through their families. They also supposedly possess the magic power of the twin goddesses of Ease. I'm gonna go out on a limb and guess that this blue-haired naked lady on the start screen is one of said goddesses. Oh hi there, totally unrelated amnesiac woman with blue hair. It's weird how much you and that harmonica player in Minea look alike. Well anyways, the dialogue mostly consists of solid world-building before pointing the player in the right direction. Though you can find some character moments if you know where to look. Once you've collected the first three books, it's off to Darm Tower to get the other three. 
This one gigantic dungeon takes up the entire second half of Ease, and aside from having way too much backtracking, is notable for featuring the introduction of a legend. <laughs> Entering into the game like an 8-bit Kool-Aid man, Dogi became so popular with fans that he was promoted to Adol's best friend slash heterosexual life partner in Ease 3, and aside from Ease 5, has remained at his side since. It all culminates in a big showdown with... Hang on, do I need to put up a spoiler warning first? On the one hand, it's impossible to discuss so much as the premise of Ease 2 without spoiling the ending to the first game. But on the other hand, there might be somebody watching this who is playing Ease 1 as I speak and wants to see the final boss for themselves first. Hmm. Okay. Come on out, boys. <laughs> Skip ahead to hear for my final thoughts on the first Ease, and then, uh... Pause the video before I get to Ease 2, I guess? It all culminates in a big showdown with the villain behind the monsters overrunning the island. Dark Fact. <laughs> Dark Fact. It sounds like what an emo 13-year-old would name their Sonic OC. On a more awesome note, while I was working on this script, I learned that the Turbo Graphics version includes voice acting. Oh, I have heard about your bravery. You're going to Darm Tower to find the book, aren't you? The locals here call it the Tower of Death. You can imagine why. The door only opens from one direction, so none of the gruesome creatures inside can creep out. And in the English release, Mr. Fact here is played by none other than Michael Bell, Raziel from Soul Reaver. The name Dark Fact will be the scourge of all men to come. <laughs> oh, you are brave, but you are also a fool. You have no chance without the protection of the silver equipment. Knave, prepare to die! I have no smart-ass remark here. I just love Michael Bell and everything I've ever heard him in. It will arouse their suspicion. And if that happens, we will have to punish you. We will, I promise you! As for the fight itself... Holy shit! This guy does not fuck around. Constantly summoning fireballs that splinter into smaller fireballs on impact while he pinballs around like an old screensaver. We could have some sort of riddle. Wait for it. Like something that you have to look for. Sort of a where's Waldo. Oh! <laughs> to top off this shit sandwich, he takes out chunks of the stage every time you damage him. You will get trapped at least once before you get the hang of this fight. It's even worse if you're an idiot like me and completely forget the blatant warning you're given about his cloak being resistant to everything but silver and don't switch to all silver equipment before the fight starts. This is why I don't try to offer too many gameplay tips in my videos. I don't so much beat the games that I play on this channel, so much as I bumble my way through until I somehow make it to the ending. The truth is I just kept crawling and it kept working. Speaking of that ending, there really isn't much of one. Dark Fact is defeated, and... the adventure continues. Hello, chumps. Who would put a sign like that there? It's very unsatisfying and makes Ease feel more like half of a game than a complete experience. Either Falcom decided to split this into two games for some reason, or they had a lot of faith in the game doing well enough to warrant a sequel. Ancient E's Vanished Omen, or Ancient E's Vanished Omen, I've seen it with and without the colon, is an instrumental title in the refinement of the then nascent action RPG subgenre, and one that is actually still quite fun to play today. While I focused primarily on the Windows re release, I also completed both the PC88 and TurboGrafx CD versions, and while I continue to prefer Chronicles Plus as the best way to experience E's, I was particularly struck by the playability of the PC-88 original, demonstrating to me that there was something special to Ease from the outset. With a basic yet extremely addictive gameplay loop and a stellar soundtrack, Ease 1 laid the foundation for what future installments would build upon, and continues to make for a fun time to this day. The biggest downside would have to be the extremely short length, clocking in at around 4-5 to five hours, probably closer to 2.5 or 3 if you know what you're doing. Coupled with an ending that barely feels like an ending at all, this would be a much bigger downside were Ease not constantly bundled with its direct sequel, Ease 2 Ancient Ease Vanished The Final Chapter. 
And again, I'd like to remind everyone that it's impossible to discuss Ease 2 without spoiling the ending to Ease 1. This is your final warning. Released just under a year after the original, Ease 2, which is what I'll be calling it for the rest of the video because that subtitle is too damn long, was ported nearly as many times as the first and picks up right where its predecessor left us hanging. Adol is warped from Darm Tower in a flash of light and awakes in a field with a girl named Lilia standing over him. Lilia explains to Adol that he's found his way to Ease and is not too far from her hometown. Which is good seeing as how that teleporter light stole all his money, levels, and equipment. Well, that's how it goes in two of the versions I played. The Turbo Graphics version does a cool thing where it smoothly transitions from Ease 1 to 2 with your level intact as if the two games were one. The rest of your stuff still gets stolen, though. Not sure why newer versions didn't do this as well. They really feel to me like they should have been a single game. Oh well, time to go kick some more monster ass! Where your level in Ease 1 capped out at a pitiful 10, Ease 2 raised the cap high enough that I'm not exactly sure if there is one. Even after your health maxes out at 255, your attack and defense keep ticking up with each level. The core combat, meanwhile, is practically unchanged here save for the introduction of magic. I mean, you get a fire spell and time freeze magic, but most of the magic you find is more utility focused. Showing hidden doorways, warping Adol back to town, way more convenient than the single-use wing item, by the way, and transforming Adol into one of these cute little Rue critters. Aw, oh, how adorable! He's still got a tuft of red hair in Rue form! Oh, I forgot about the shield spell! Though since you only get it a bit before the final boss, there's not much to say about this one. I didn't use the time freeze one all that much either, come to think of it. Having any sort of ranged attack in a game like this is far more handy than better defense or being able to stop enemies in their tracks. Besides, you can't switch spells mid-boss battle and you sort of need fireballs to hurt most bosses. In addition, Ease 2 is a much larger game with convoluted dungeons to match. Though I feel that Falcom's ambition may have overstepped their means here, as the total lack of a map is a far more noticeable problem than it was in its predecessor. In Ease 1, while there was the occasional dead end, and it could be easy to forget which floor of Darm Tower you needed to backtrack to at points, the overall design of the dungeons were pretty straightforward. If you could find the stairs, then you were headed in the right direction. Ease 2, meanwhile, relies far more on screen changes and multiple sets of staircases leading every which way. Add in the fact that so many of these rooms look alike and you're in for a frustrating time. I can understand the original version lacking a map, seeing as how many computer games of the 80s and early 90s were made with the expectation that players would have a notepad and graph paper handy. But a map seems like an obvious quality of life addition for a console port. There's also a slight change to the combat meta that, as far as I can tell, is exclusive to the complete slash chronicles version of Ease 2. Rather than attacking enemies from off-center, now the game wants you to run into them diagonally. Once my muscle memory adjusted to this, I actually came to prefer it. This adjustment makes chaining from one enemy to the next feel far more fluid without removing the risk of taking damage if your angle isn't quite right. Plus, bodying monsters into a corner until they explode into gory chunks is very satisfying. Yeah, you, you definitely gotta get him out of the stable more. The biggest improvement in my opinion is with the bosses. Where most bosses in the first Ease feel like afterthoughts, either being barely a challenge at all or just plain confusing, bosses in Ease 2 are genuine tests of skill. Not the most difficult of tests, but a huge step in the right direction. This seems to me to be where Falcom began to get a better sense of what they wanted boss fights to be like in Ease. Taking cues from the shoot-'em-ups that were all the rage at the time, bosses in Ease 2 are about dodging the mass of projectiles fired at you, then shooting back at them with a few fireballs. Now, I'm not a huge fan of shoot-'em-ups. I've never had the reflexes for them, or the cognitive ability to process rows upon rows of death heading for me. Here, though, I find it to be a challenge that keeps me on my toes without leaving me screaming at my screen, demanding to know how the hell am I supposed to dodge that? So that probably puts it on the easier end of things for people who don't suck at shmups. Of course, that's just for the Windows side of things. The PC-88 and Turbo Graphics version? I had a much harder time. The PC-88 version is such a grind. Enemies give out a pittance of XP, yet you have to spend a ton of time getting your level up to the point that the game deems you worthy of being able to damage any of the enemies in the first real dungeon. Compounding my frustration is how it's now impossible to pin enemies against walls as they will eventually turn and walk into you, 
forcing me to play this game of bumping into them until they're almost to the wall before backing off. I thought this was a glitch at first until I got to Ease 2 in the Turbo Graphics version and it did the same thing to me. This made it so that once I got the fire spell, I stuck to spamming it against every enemy. It's all but required in some spots too, since the game is quite fond of hiding enemies where no one could possibly know they were unless they'd already played Ease 2 before. How is this fair? In what world is it fair to hide enemies inside a screen transition like this, huh? The Turbo Graphics version fares a tad better in that the grind is less aggravating because of the speed of the game. It took me roughly two hours to finish the first dungeon on PC88, whereas it only took me little over an hour on Turbo Graphics. It still maintains my issues with the bump system that I had with the PC88 version though, so I wound up with the same problem of relying almost entirely on standing still and spamming Fireball. Suffice it to say, I didn't enjoy these versions as much as I enjoyed the first games. That reminds me, the music is just as awesome here in Ease 2 as it is in Ease 1. Regardless of which version of the game we're talking about, it's top-notch stuff. Personally, I think the Turbo Graphics rearrangement has the weakest of the three, but that's purely in comparison to the other two. If I were comparing it to other games from the time, it would likely be up much higher. Everything else I can say about the soundtrack would pretty much just be me repeating what I already said about the first games. So let's move on to the story. As he makes his way through the first dungeon, Adol comes across shrines to the six priests. At each of these shrines, he's contacted by the spirits of said priests, who explain that he was brought to Ease with the power of the Books of Ease to fulfill an ancient prophecy of Ease. That's called character branding, true believers. I invented it. Nothing too crazy here, but as good an excuse as any for me to get my dungeon crawl on. The evil in question that Adol must defeat is Darm, a vile demon sealed inside the Black Pearl by the goddesses hundreds of years ago. However, his loyal servants, led by the sorcerer Dallas, seek to unleash their lord onto an unsuspecting world. Adol will have to travel all over Ease, across icy mountains and through volcanic caverns in order to reach Solomon's Shrine, formerly one of the holiest sites in Ease, now home to Darm's demon army. This time around, the villains don't wait until the very end to make an appearance. Not only do Darm and Dallas feature in the opening, but Adol gets multiple run-ins with Dallas before their final boss fight. Even more so in Chronicles, where it actually cuts to Dallas responding to Adol's progress Saturday morning cartoon villain style. The Thunder Kittens have found the Golden Sphere of Seti! It's a shame that the Turbo Graphics version doesn't have this, seeing as how Dallas is voiced by Jim Cummings there. All communication to Darm Tower has been cut off. What should we do to stop this rogue? Not THE go-to villain voice actor at the time, but it's not like they got Skeletor to play Darm or something. His bravery presents an interesting challenge. Let's see how far this Adol character can go before we crush him. Man, I really wish I liked this version more. While the plot itself is nothing outside the ordinary, there's a noticeable increase in the focus side characters get. In the first ease, NPCs were there to either provide hints or foreshadowing. What few moments of characterization were present had to be sought out by the player. In contrast, Ease 2's story actually attempts to weave a few side stories into its narrative. The easiest example to point to is right near the start where Adol has to rescue the town doctor from a mine collapse, and in the process learns that Lilia is dying from an unspecified illness. Being the chronic hero that he is, Adol helps track down the ingredients that Dr. Flair needs for the medicine. Where Ease 1 would have left at Lilia's mom thanking you and moved on, Ease 2 takes a moment to have Lilia waiting outside. Alongside the expected thanks, Lilia admits to Adol that her cheerful attitude was the result of her trying to live in the present, having sensed that her illness was far more dire than everyone would have her believe. It's a simple moment that's over in an instant, but provides just that little bit more characterization to make Lilia feel like more than a mere prop for advancing the story. Scenes like this show the ambitions for higher levels of storytelling in their games that we'd see both in later Falcom titles and with Quintet, 
The company Tomoyoshi Miyazaki and Masaya Hashimoto would co-found a year after East 2's release. There are a handful of similar moments scattered across the game, and while I'd never go so far as to say that Ease 2 has a good story, it does its job well enough to keep the player invested in the world and characters. In a gets more messed up the longer you think about it sort of way, Ease 2 even offers a bit of depth to the demons and monsters when you're in Rue form. On top of being absolutely adorable, Adol can communicate with monsters while disguised as a Rue. This winds up revealing that these creatures are completely sentient and capable of their own thoughts and feelings. It puts an unexpected twist on all the monster slaying you've been doing across two games. Then again, I am only a few more kills away from a level up. Once you make it to Solomon's Shrine, story threads that have been building since Ease 1 finally begin to come into view. That means it's time for a second spoiler warning. If you don't want the rest of the story spoiled for you, well, you should know what to do after last time. It's in Ramia Village, a settlement just outside Solomon's Shrine, that Adol learns about how Dallas and his minions have been kidnapping villagers in order to offer them up as sacrifices to Darm. Add one more thing to Adol's heroic to-do list. Not far into his attack on Solomon's Shrine, Adol stumbles right into Dallas himself. Rather than fight, Dallas chooses to gloat and give our hero a simple offer. Adol chooses to call the sorcerer's bluff and tries to head past him. In retaliation, Dallas turns him into a Rue going through a goth phase. Well, this isn't good. Now I have to find a cure as I avoid enemies while in this vulnerable state. Oh. Well, that was a bit of an oversight on Dallas' part. As amusing as it would be to finish the game in this state, you are sadly forced to find a cure before the escaped would-be sacrifices will let Adol into their hiding place in the waterways beneath the shrine. Does this count as a sewer level? I feel like it should count as a sewer level. Adol has to backtrack to Ramia Village where, fortunately, an old man who can speak monster lives. Super fortunately, he has a well of magic in his basement that can cure Adol, though he needs to drink said water out of a specific holy cup in order for the magic to work properly. Considering that Solomon's Shrine used to be, you know, a shrine before the monsters and demons took over, it's pretty likely such a cup is hidden somewhere around there. One minute, 37 seconds later. That wasn't hard at all. Now to save those folks down in the waterways and walk right into Dallas' real plan of tricking Adol into revealing the location of his runaway sacrifices. Shit. Dallas turns them all to stone and leaves Adol alone in his new stone garden. He made one critical mistake, however. He left Adol alive. As long as that ginger has breath in his lungs and a sword in his hand, there is no stopping him. The next bit of gameplay, on the other hand, is my least favorite part of Ease 2. Every time I get here without fail, I wind up getting lost several times because all the backtracking across the shrine and through the waterways makes it hard for me to get my bearings after a while. I didn't do myself any favors by playing this section late at night with both the Windows and TurboGrafx versions. I wanted to get to this point in the PC-88 one as well, but the grind became too much for me. The spirit was willing, but the brain was bored and impatient. Someday, I'll break through that barrier and be able to properly enjoy 80s PC games. That day is not today. After finding my, I mean his, bearings, Adol discovers a monster hiding away from the others. Meet Keith, a monster capable of speaking the human tongue who was actually first encountered off-screen back before Solomon's Shrine, where he's being held in the same prison as the kid who Adol came to rescue. In fact, it's because of Keith that Adol is able to rescue the boy at all. Thanks to a black pearl Adol passed through to them, which I think is a different black pearl than the one Darn was sealed in, if this was properly explained, then I missed it. Anyhow, the Black Pearl empowered Keith with the might to break down a wall doggy style. I have a son! But so consumed him with murderous rage that he had to flee before he and Adol could meet face to face then. He's much calmer now and hands our hero the key he needs to lower the water level so Adol can get out of these accursed waterways already and onto the next part of the shrine. Like any good plot-important NPC, Keith beat Adol here and lets him know that the next sacrifice will occur any second now. Impassable barriers! Adol's one weakness! No worries, we have plenty of time. Keith said something about a bell needing to ring five times before the sacrifice can occur, and in all this time I haven't heard it ring-
Such a brave warrior you are, Edol. I am truly impressed that you've made it to this lofty point. I commend your efforts. However, you'll be distressed to hear that I've already rung the death bell four times. I do love this. Now please, enjoy the sweet sound of the bell's last ring. <laughs> Well, fuck. Maybe we got lucky and it missed- Aw, oh, she dead. All Adel can do now is keep pushing forward. And at long last, he finds the one sanctuary in Solomon's Shrine where the goddesses still wield a bit of power. In their big info dump, the goddesses gave Adel instructions on how to unpetrify the poor saps that Dallas turned to stone. However, it requires the black pearl that he handed over in order to free Keith and the kid he actually went to save. What was that boy's name again? Tarf? Tarf? Okay, a lizard man named Keith was already stretching it, but I draw the line at the name Tarf. It's a good thing that Tarf picked now of all times to head off on his own to Ramia Village. Guess the trip was pretty easy when all he had to do was step over the mountain of corpses Adel left in his wake. Not quite as good as that he managed to lose the damn pearl after making it all the way there. You're so lucky that Dallas is almost as stupid, leaving it completely unsecured in an empty room after showing it off to his minions. About damn time something went Adel's way again. After the goddesses combine the Black Pearl with this weird idol that Adol found in the Sacrificing Tower, all he has to do now is get everyone unstoned. Ironically, having to do it from the same spot where Dallas rang the sacrificial bell. Back in the waterways where the survivors have fled to, all of them are back to normal and even one happens to have gotten a hold of the necklace that Adol needs to reach the inner sanctum of the shrine where Dallas awaits. Now it's time for me to cop to being a moron once again, as I didn't pay enough attention to Dallas's pre-fight gloating. People with ADD, they aren't good readers. Wanna go shave a dog? I died several times before I realized he's one of the only bosses you need to attack physically. Once I did that, he went down like a chump. Onward to the core of Ease itself. First off, I love this alien Magitek aesthetic this whole area has going on. It's so different from everything else that came before, and the total lack of any more enemies on the way to the final showdown with Darm is ominous as all hell. The actual fight with Darm is pretty much just a less bullshit version of the fight with Dark Fat, and so long as you have the goddess's ring equipped, his fireballs are slow enough to dodge as you chip away at his massive pool of health. At least in the Windows version. The Turbo Graphics one I straight up couldn't beat. I tried several times, but I couldn't get the rhythm down. So go ahead and mark me down as a filthy casual. It's a long battle, but Adel manages to strike down Darm. This time around, he gets a well-deserved celebration for his efforts, ending with a moment alone with Fina, the amnesiac girl from the first game, who must soon end her time among mortals and return to the heavens. Totally called her being one of the goddesses, by the way. All she asks of Adel is that he remember her as a woman and not a goddess. You see what I mean about Adel? The dude accidentally wooed a goddess. There's being a charmer, and then there's the Alcibiades level of pure riz that Adol possesses. There's an argument to be made that this is the real reason that he never actively pursues anyone, despite the conga line of women pining for him across the series. But, it's funnier for me to treat it like adventuring is the only way he can get off. So I'm gonna keep doing that. <laughs> despite retaining the same framework, Ease 2, Ancient Ease Vanished, the final chapter, The Revenge of, The Reckoning, colon, Freddy's Dead, is a big improvement over the original Ease. Expanding on the gameplay and setting the standard for the excellent boss fights that would become emblematic of the rest of the series. And though the story is pretty standard if you're comparing it to newer games, it's executed well enough to keep you invested in what everyone comes to Ease for, the gameplay. The only major criticism I have are the amount of backtracking forced on the player once they reach Solomon's Shrine, and the lack of a map making it far too easy to get lost while doing said backtracking. The latter part can be mitigated with the help of the many fan-made maps that can be found online, making it only rise to the level of minor frustration to me. It still should have been added in the remakes, though. Unlike with Ease 1, however, I feel that both the PC-88 and TurboGrafx versions of Ease 2 are much weaker than the Windows version. 
The PC-88 original is simply too grindy for my ADHD-riddled brain, and the inability to pin enemies against walls until they're bumped to death made for a dull, frustrating experience for me. Meanwhile, the TurboGrafx version does hold up better and is a less frustrating experience, but still possesses similar issues that I had with the PC-88's bump system. The Windows version, specifically Chronicles Plus, is where Ease 2 shines the strongest in my opinion. Overall, Ease 1 and 2 make for a strong start to a fantastic series. I think every action fan, RPG fan, or action RPG fan owe it to themselves to at least try out Chronicles Plus, available on both Steam and GOG. If you're curious about other versions and don't mind playing it in Japanese, several of the home computer ports of Ease 1 and 2 are available on Project Egg. In fact, you can even get a bundle of the first three games on PC-88, as well as 4 and 5 on the Super Famicom for about 20 US dollars. If nothing else, it's a nice way to have legit digital versions of these games. Unfortunately, a legit copy of the TurboGrafx version, being for the TurboGrafx CD and all, is much harder to get a hold of. Your choice is to either get screwed by scalpers on a physical copy, or get screwed by scalpers on a TurboGrafx Mini. And the industry wonders why piracy and emulation are so rampant. No, it's the children who are wrong. Honestly though, the most readily available version is both the best and most affordable version, so that would be the one I would go with if I were you. That's all for this game, I'll see you next time. Spirits of evil transform this decayed form to mum. <laughs>